Oh, I'm Cass. Hi guys. Um, and this is a tumble home night. And if you don't know what that is, I'm gonna give you a quick recap on where we've been the last couple of months. Is that okay? So who doesn't know what a tumble home is? Oh yeah, I love this. Okay, good. So a tumble home is a bit of a ship that keeps us upright, steady, secure and coming back to home base. It's the thing that lets us go through the water with great speed. And as a creative team at the start of the year, we said that our tumble home for 2021 was going to be, I beg your pardon, worship. That actually we are not just a creative team, but we're a worshipping team. And Toza had this really good quote that said, God wants worshippers before He wants workers. And so we agreed that that was going to be the stance that we came into this year with. And then Jad Gillies a few weeks back, he preached an incredible message on having a worship footing. And that was like, um, it was meant to relate to the war footing that people had when they went into battle. And that we would have a stance of readiness when it came to worship. And that we were actually going to worship before we felt like it and we were gonna find God in those spaces. And so I feel like every month we are actually adding on our revelation of worship because that is who we are as a team, whether we're on lighting consoles or out the bat, we actually worship as our default and it matters to us. Is that okay? So tonight, Rich is gonna come and he has something to share around that. But in Anglican style, I'm gonna ask you to open up your phone or your Bible. I'm gonna get you to turn with me to Mark 6. And you're going to love this so much because it is a tiny bit random. Mark 6, chapter, uh, verse 14. Got it? Have you all got your Bibles in front of you? Okay, and here's what I want you to do. When you see things that stand out to you, highlight it because you might need it. Okay, it is entitled, John the Baptist Beheaded. Ooh. Okay, it says, King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he's Elijah. And still others claimed he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. And Herod himself gave orders to have John arrested and he had him bound and put in prison. And he did this because of Herodias, the brother of Philip's wife, whom he married. For John had been saying to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. And when Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. And then it says, finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a great banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. And when the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and all of his dinner guests. And the king asked the girl, ask me for anything you want and I will give it to you. And he promised her an oath, whatever you ask for, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. So she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. And at once a girl hurried into the king with the request. I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was greatly distressed. But because of his oath and because of his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. And the man went, beheaded John in the prison and brought back his head on a platter. And he presented it to the girl and she gave it to her mother. And on hearing this, John's disciples came and took his body and carried it to a tomb. This is the Word of God. He is going to speak to us through this passage tonight. So I'm going to pray for us and then Rich is going to come. So Father... What a passage, what a story. God, I don't actually know what you're gonna teach us tonight from it, but we open our heart and our ears to hear you and to listen. God, I pray that you would draw us closer to yourselves, that we would become a reflection of you. That God, you would work deep in our heart to bring about change. We love you, we listen for you, and we wanna honour you with our lives tonight. Bless Rich as he comes. May the words of his mouth and the meditation of his heart be pleasing and acceptable to you. In Jesus' Name and the whole of Hillsong Creative said, 
Amen. So put your hands together for Rich. Thank you, thank you. How fun is this? Okay. Uh, please be seated everywhere that you have a seat. Um, <laughs> all right. So um, that was random. The beheading of John the Baptist. Was it not? Okay. Um, for those of you in other places here, everyone's being a bit quiet, and that might freak me out. So you need to, like, please, at least if I ask you a question. Okay. Yeah, nice. Okay. Very good. Hey, so with your, if you've got your phones out, uh, keep them out. And I, I figure maybe, like, you don't have to t take notes. Uh, you can if you want to. But at, at certain points, I'm going to ask some questions. And I would love it if you jot down the answers. Uh, they're big questions, and I don't think you'll actually um, be able to write a, like a full answer to the questions that I ask you, but I want you to at least attempt it. Humor me, if you can. Okay, so um, thank you, Kimmy. So um, uh, a few weeks back uh, when I was asked to speak at the Tumble Home night, it was actually the night that Jad spoke, but I was sick, and so I, I didn't get to speak that night. Uh, and so Jad stepped in and he did speak a great message. And if you haven't heard it, I would encourage you to go listen to that. But on that night, um, I was allocated by Gabe Kelly. Thank you, Gabe. The, uh, the scripture that we just read, um, not really. He, he said, um, look, wouldn't it be great if we used our Mark um, journal, uh, our, our soap studies, and just kind of followed the the verses and the passages and use what, you know, the passage as it comes up. And so on that Thursday, a few weeks back, it was the passage about the beheading of John the Baptist. And I got to be honest, like I looked at the scripture reference and I didn't think too much of it until I sat down to prepare for the message. And then I'm like, okay, um, either the Holy Spirit is having a joke or Gabe was, because I definitely don't want to be speaking about the beheading of John the Baptist, because what is there to learn from that passage? I literally was like, yeah, no, I'm not doing that. Uh, but it was kind of in the same moment that I also remembered the scripture about how all scripture is God-breathed and all scripture is actually useful and it can be uh, beneficial to us. And so I'm like, all right, I'm up for the challenge. Let's do this. I don't know where we might go, but I'm up for it. Are you up for it with me? Okay, that's good. I'm glad. Um, now, obviously, it's a tumble home night as well. And so then that, made, that brought another problem. I had to sort of somehow work out how, to, how do we talk about worship and tumble home and also being beheaded. Um, they, they don't feel like they go together. But then, as if by fate or the Lord... Um, I discovered that, yeah, you know, tumble homes are not just in the marine industry, but they are also in the automotive industry. Yeah. Cars. Car design. Okay, so do you know what a tumble home is? No, no, no. In a car? Yeah, no. Good. Neither did I. Okay, so a tumble home in a car is the design that puts the, uh, the top of the car... Uh, more inwards than, than the middle of the car. The door is wider than the roof. There, that's it. That's a tumble home. Yeah, it's fascinating, right? Yeah, okay. So the thing about that is that when I was reading this passage about, about be, be, being beheaded, it was, a, it was a huge stretch for me. I've got to be honest. I'm like, I, I just don't want to do it. Okay, but... A tumble home in a car, the reason they do it is actually to, to make space on the inside. It's to make the interior of the car actually more spacious. And I'm like, huh, isn't it interesting that we're talking about tumble homes and, and we've got this crazy passage that we maybe might want to ignore, that I certainly did want to ignore, and yet in actually approaching it, it makes certainly my insides greater. It's a stretch. It makes, it makes room on the inside for maybe what God might want to do. And, and I honestly believe that when I put two and two together about those two things, I realized that maybe God was up to something and that maybe, just maybe, uh, He does want to speak to us tonight and challenge us tonight because this is not an easy passage of Scripture. 
You know, it, it's not like, it's not a passage where, where um, the followers of Jesus are winning. They're losing. Yeah. It's kind of a bit quiet in here, everybody. I'm not sure about where you are. Anyways, um, let me give you some quick context and then we'll get into the passage. Okay, so this, this, this story, in the whole of Mark, it's the only story that is not about Jesus. It's the only time where the focus is not on what Jesus is doing. This one time, the writer, Mark, he puts in the story, he includes it about, about the beheading of John the Baptist. Why does he do it? Yeah, that's what I wondered too. Um, no, he does it. He does it to get our attention. He does it on purpose because he knows, like I have discovered, that there's so much richness in, in this passage, in this story. And there's so much for us to take on. But as I said, it's not a story of winning. It's a story of losing. Um, we find that John the Baptist is in prison and he's been there for like a year already. It's not a short time. He, um, he had this triumphant moment with Jesus where he is, you know, he baptizes Jesus and that's awesome. And then sometime after that, probably not long after that, he gets arrested and he gets put in prison and his ministry comes to like this crazy halt. It ends, literally. <laughs> Jesus' ministry is just getting going. His disciples are just getting going. And John the Baptist is in prison, soon to be killed. Put yourself into that scenario for a minute. Okay, we're going to do things a little bit different tonight. I'm literally just going to read the passage again, and we're going to see what it says. Okay, so King Herod, verse 14. If you have it, look at it there. King Herod heard about this. For Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying John the Baptist has been risen from the dead and that was why miraculous powers are at work in him. And others said, he is Elijah. And still others claimed he is a prophet like one of the prophets from long ago. It says there that Herod, um, it said Herod heard about all this. And I'm like, okay, what did Herod hear about? Well, we have to take a sneaky little view of the verses just before this because Herod had heard that, John, that Jesus had sent out his disciples and that they were ministering in Jesus' name. It's the first time that the disciples are actually getting to do the stuff. You know, they're finally, they've been following Jesus, he's been teaching them and now they get to go do it. And so they do and, and they start ministering in Jesus' name. It says in those previous um, verses, in verse 7, um, Jesus was called, he called out the 12 and he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. They now had authority. And then in verse 12, they went out and preached that people should repent and they drove out demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. I mean, it's getting crazy for the disciples. They're starting to do all the stuff. Okay, so Mark's just put that. And then next thing, John the Baptist is getting beheaded. Kind of crazy. But Herod had, was hearing about what Jesus was up to. It started to make a bit of a stir and it was getting attention. And so people were starting to, to talk about what Jesus was doing. Um, they started rumours. They didn't know Jesus because it was the disciples out there ministering, but they knew because it was in Jesus' name that something was going on. Alrighty, so they said he was either a, a, you know, a prophet or he was Elijah or he's um, John the Baptist. A, a prophet, the reason they thought that he might have been a prophet is because they were hoping that prophecy might be still a thing. Because it had been like 400 years since the last prophet died. Prophecy was dead. There was nothing happening on that front. They were hoping that Jesus maybe, just maybe, might be like those prophets that used to come and bring the word of the Lord. But they, they kind of got it right because he was obviously, he was obviously you know, the God man, but he wasn't quite a prophet. And then they thought, oh, maybe he's Elijah. Now, I think this is funny because Elijah was a prophet. So it's like, okay, is he a prophet or is he Elijah? Well, Elijah was a prophet. So what difference does it make? The difference, I'm going quick. There's lots to take in. The difference that it makes is that Elijah was special and Elijah was going to come just before the Messiah was going to come. So this was even better than just a prophet. See, if Elijah came, that meant the Messiah was coming. And if the Messiah was coming, that meant freedom was coming. And they were hoping for that. 
So they thought maybe it was Elijah. But Jesus says that John the Baptist was actually Elijah. John the Baptist was Elijah in spirit. And so they were kind of right. The people were on the right track. They just had the wrong person. And then they're like, oh, it must be John the Baptist because, you know, he, he uh, got killed by Herod. And um, so that may, maybe is who, who's doing all of these crazy things. Uh, and in fact, you know, obviously Jesus wasn't John the Baptist. John the Baptist was John the Baptist. But they had a similar message, which was this. It was repent and believe for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe for the kingdom of God is at hand. You want to remember that. Repent and believe for the kingdom of God is at hand. So rumours are circulating. They were trying to work out who Jesus was. And I figure that's not unlike today. If you talk to people, you know, your friends who don't know the Lord, and you, and you say, who was Jesus? They'll go, I don't know. Maybe he was a prophet. Maybe he was a good man. Some will say that maybe he didn't even exist. Um, which, side note, it's really hard to prove historically. So there's so much evidence that Jesus was a real person that actually walked, actually did the things that, he, that we think he did. But they thought, some, some people will say, yeah, he's a prophet or whatever. But the, the bottom line is, the question remains, who is Jesus? That was the question they really had. Who is this person? And I think that's the question that people still have. And in fact, it's the question that Mark was trying to answer in his whole book. If you go and read the whole thing, you'll discover that Mark is, is hinting all the way through as to who Jesus is. And, it, and honestly, he makes it pretty clear because right in, at the very start, the very first verse, he goes this, Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Okay, now we know who he is. But we have hindsight, whereas the people didn't know that. But here's the thing, Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. So Mark is trying to show us that Jesus is the Messiah, right? But today we know who Jesus is. We declare that we live for him. You know, wherever we're, we're joining us from and in this room, we're, we're believers. We believe that Jesus was who he said he was. So here's the question for your notes, if you want to write it down. Something like this, or the answer. My question is this, if Jesus is our Messiah, if he's our Saviour and the Son of God, then how should we respond? What does it look like to, for us to take that knowledge and put it into practice? What would it look like for us to live, you know, right now, in the, in the moment, at team night, at a tumble home night, what would it look like for us to take that knowledge and understanding and put it in, like, make it real, like make, turn it into action. As we keep going through the rest of the passage, I really want you to keep that in mind. What would it look like to live out the fact that Jesus is the Messiah? All right, we've got to keep going. So verse 16, but when Herod heard about this, the rumours, he said, John, whom I, I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to John to have John arrested and he had him bound and put in prison. And he, he did it because of Herodias, his brother, brother, brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Gosh, so John is busted for calling out Herod's marriage. For he preached against Herod's marriage. So what was wrong with his marriage? Um, you may or may not know this, but it's kind of weird to marry your brother's wife. Um, uh, I don't know. No? I don't know. Anyway, it gets weirder than that. Let me read this. So um, the bottom line was his marriage was anti-God's anti law. It was immoral. And so he, this king, Herod, he, was, he wasn't actually a king. He was a tetrarch, but we can talk about that another time. Um, he... he um, he wanted to be the king of the Jews. Like he wanted to be like David or like any of the Old Testament kings that you would know about. He wanted to be the Jewish people's king. And yet he wasn't living in the Jewish people's way. He was being ungodly. He had already, so his marriage, let me describe it. Um, he was already married when he got together with Herodias. 
So he married the daughter of the king of Nepotia, right? The bordering nation. But he left her. And when he left her, he caused this massive war. So the two nations are now <laughs> at, at, at war. But um, his wife, uh, she was also married when, uh, and left her husband to marry Herod. And the husband she left was, was Herod's half-brother. That's kind of weird. Okay. But then, um, to make things a little bit more bizarre, she also was his niece. I know. So she was the daughter of another brother of Herod. And, um, and Herod the Great, Herod's, this Herod's dad, had him killed. And the emperor, I love this, Emperor Augustus, he goes, uh, it's better to be Herod's pig than his son. Because Herod would just kill his kids. He had like 10 wives, lots of kids. Maybe it didn't matter to him. I don't know. Anyways, crazy times. <laughs> so bottom line, Herod was living an immoral life. And, and it, didn't, it, was, it extended far beyond this. But, but John called him out for it. And, and I think that's interesting for us. Because, you know, like... There's a lot we could say about calling out immorality and sin and the stuff we perceive in, in people in power's lives. There's, there's a lot we could say about calling out you know, people on social media or on, in our conversations. And, and you know, I, I see it like you do all the time. And sometimes I want to be that guy. I want to call stuff out. But then it got me thinking about John the Baptist and it made me wonder if any of us honestly live as holy a life, as set apart life as he did. You know, we want the benefit of being able to call things out. But I wonder if we need to take a step back first. I wonder if we want to maybe look at how, you know, John the Baptist, he was chosen before he was born to be special, to be holy. And he didn't just ignore that. He actually stepped into it. He lived it. And we know, because we know it's coming, even to the point of death. He didn't ignore that stuff. And so he didn't go just willy-nilly calling stuff out. He actually lived a holy, blameless life first. And so I think we maybe should just take, take a minute, take stock for a minute. And, and I wonder if maybe we need to just um, reassess ourselves and the way we live before we go wanting to call out stuff in other people's lives. I wonder if that maybe is what, what the example of John the Baptist is actually calling for. You know, holiness means to be set apart, to be altogether different. And he was different. He ate locusts and honey. He wore camel's hair. He didn't fit in. He wasn't normal. So my question in this section you know, what would it look like to actually live that kind of set-apart life? How would we be different? I've got to keep going. Verse 19, so Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him, but she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. I think that's so fascinating, don't you? That Herod liked to listen to him. He didn't want to do what he was saying, but he liked hearing what he preached about. Even the stuff he didn't actually like, he liked to hear. So John is in prison and Herod uh, put him there. And yet, so, so John couldn't actually go preach publicly. So John would just preach in the prison. And who would listen? Herod would go listen. And then John would just keep preaching at him and Herod would listen. The thing is, he didn't, he didn't ever do any of the stuff that John was talking about. He just kept living the same old way. I think that is so crazy. And it reminds me of Ezekiel, strangely. But there's this, there's this passage in Ezekiel where it talks about how the people of God, they would go listen to Ezekiel, but they wouldn't do what he said. And, and it relates to us. I think you'll hear why. In Ezekiel 33, they're going to put it up. Th verse 31. My people come to you. This is God speaking. My people come to you as they usually do and sit before you to hear God's word, but they do not put them into practice. Their mouths speak of love, 
but their hearts are greedy and are unjust and for unjust gain. Indeed, to them, you, Ezekiel, are nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and plays an instrument well. For they hear your words, but they do not put them into practice. Man, I read that and I'm like, how often is that me? How often is that us? You know, particularly when it comes to the love of music and the sweet sound of a good voice. You know, gosh, I put it to you. I put it to you that maybe some of us are in danger of doing the same thing that Herod did. And some of us are in danger of doing exactly the same thing as Israel did to Ezekiel. We want to hear all the good stuff, but we don't want to do it. We want to hear all about the blessings of Jesus, but we don't want to actually live it. And I, like, trust me, I'm preaching to myself even as much as I'm preaching to any of us. But I think about now, coming out of COVID, you know, oh, I, like, I, like, I like being involved until I don't like being involved. I like to serve until I, I don't like to serve. Oh, you're asking too much of me. Oh, yeah, I used to do that, but I don't want to do that anymore. And I'm just, they're all the things that I've said to myself, you know, not, not even things that I've heard you guys say, although I know you do. I know you do. I know that this is a difficult time coming out of COVID, but I put it to you that we're at risk of wanting all the blessings of God without actually wanting to put stuff into practice. One of the things He, he, to, he wants us to do is actually serve Him. So the gospel is all about Jesus, his way, not our way. It's all about doing things so that he gets glorified, not that we get glorified. And this thing we're a part of, this church that we're a part of, it's actually all about Christ. You know this, but I'm just reminding us tonight. So my question here is this. What would it look like in 2021? What would it look like for us to yield our desires and our will to God's desire, and, and, and to put His will into every area of life, every area, all of the uncomfortable areas, all of the areas you don't want to give up, all of the things that you don't want to do. As we live real lives and we're part of Hillsong Church and Hillsong Creative, what would that look like? The job is to serve them until they find Him. Alrighty, got to keep going. Verse 21, finally the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. She pleased them. The king said to the girl, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her an oath. Whatever you ask, I'll give you up to half my kingdom. Literally everything is wrong with this picture. Think about it. <laughs> Literally everything. Um, we've already seen that, that Herod is a pretty messed up dude. He's marrying his half-brothers, sisters, uncles. I don't know. It's messed up. Um, but now, now he has his daughter come in and dance seductively for him and for the pleasure of his friends. Like you have to put yourself in the scenario. M imagine what this is like. He's, he's putting his daughter there. And so he makes a promise to her to look good in front of his friends. Um, he should be protecting her, but instead he's shopping her out for the pleasure of his mates. And she thinks it's normal, his, her mum thinks it's normal, and the community that they're, that they're in thinks it's normal. They're finding pleasure in all the wrong things. And it makes me wonder, I know this is heavy, guys, I know it, but it makes me wonder what kind of behaviour have we normalised? What have we allowed to seep into our lives that we don't even realise is there? What kind of language do we use? How do we think of each other and treat each other? You know, how do we treat those that we're serving alongside or that serve you know, us, that we're leading, or, or, or our leaders? Um, how do we speak about one another? Do we lie without even thinking about it? Do we use God's name in order to get our own gain for our own benefit? Do we lust? Do we cheat? Do we ignore the weak or the vulnerable? Do we act 
one way, but live another? Have we lost sight of what it means to be able to enter the very presence of God? So Herodias, the mother, she hated John because he was calling out her behaviour. He said it was wrong. The thing is, John didn't hate her back. He invited her to repent. And it's beautiful. I don't know if you can actually catch how beautiful it is. Because John knew that there was life and there was freedom in repentance. It's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And so I don't bring up any of this stuff to kind of go, oh, we're so bad, or to call stuff out. Opposite, the opposite of that. My heart is to actually call us to repentance where we need to repent, to actually have eyes to see what God would have us see, to actually turn around and, to, and go a different way because there is life and there is freedom there. So my question, what areas do you need to change in? Where do you need to change specifically? And, and where, where do we need to repent And what areas can Christ actually set us free in? What what stuff does He want to actually help us to let go of and move on from? Alrighty, the band can probably come and join me for the big finale. All right. Okay, verse 24. We're nearly there, guys. So she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. Thank you. At once the girl hurried to the king with her request. I want, to, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed because that is weird and crazy to be asking for. But because of his oath and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. And the man went, behead, beheaded John in the prison. Catch that. The man went and beheaded John in the prison and brought back his head on a platter, presented it to the girl and she gave it to her mother. And on hearing this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Crazy. So this, is, this story is the murder of John the Baptist, right? And we haven't really even talked about John the Baptist that much. But I was, I was thinking about him, you know, what would it have been like for that year in prison? What would it have been like? Was he discouraged? Did he think, oh, I was doing so great. You know, I just baptised the Messiah. My ministry is hitting highs, <laughs> you know, all-time highs. Uh, and then I'm in prison now. Um, did, did he ever doubt? Did he ever wonder if his life was a waste? Was he disappointed with his ministry? He was meant to prepare the way for Jesus. And yet they killed Jesus and then they killed him. Twenty twenty was a crazy time, you know. And and a lot of us for life stopped. And for some watching, I know they're still you're still in the middle of it. But something tells me that John didn't kind of think that his life was a waste and that it wasn't coming to anything and the God, did God really have me, uh, you know, should, should I have really worn that camel thing? Maybe that was what got me arrested. You know, I don't think he thought any of those things actually. We don't actually know, I'm guessing. But I wonder just by the way he lived up until that point, if maybe, just maybe, his, his attitude was, was different to that. So last year was difficult for many of us and gosh, we're coming out of it, but I think that we can be encouraged by the way John's life ended actually, Uh, strangely, because he got got beheaded, you know, Um, and his disciples, uh, I think we can be encouraged by them as well, because at the end there it said that they heard about it, they heard what happened to him and they went and got the body and they buried it. In the, in the book of Matthew, where it, it tells the same story, it adds this, this other little bit. 
And the other little bit is that they took the, they went, got the body, buried it, and then they went to Jesus. It says they went to Jesus. And I think that's a key for us. Coming out of COVID, coming out of pandemic, coming out of this season that we have been in, I think the key is that we've got to keep going back to Jesus. Keep going back to Jesus. And, and we answer all those questions that I, I posed and, and, we, and we take him to Jesus. And, and we work out who he is and that he is who he said he is. And then we, we go for some repentance when we change a little bit and then we keep moving forward. Here's the thing. So, John, I get a feeling that instead of being downcast and disappointed with his ministry, I think maybe resolve carried him. I think maybe he ended his day, days with a firm conviction of his call. Because we all know, he said that I must decrease and Jesus must increase. We know that he had that in mind. And so I think he held to it. And I think maybe that was his view of success. I think maybe his worship was found in surrender. Perhaps his dependence on God was actually his worship. Could it be that his tumble home was a life offered for the sake of another? And if all this is true, what would it look like for us to step up? What would it look like here at Hills for us to step up or in Melbourne or Tassie or WA or Queensland or Northern Territory or across Asia or in Fiji? You know, what would it look like for us to actually step up in the areas, not of service, that'll come, in the areas of surrender? in the areas of radical dependence on God? What would it look like to be intentionally holy? Holy on purpose. And what would it look like if we repented daily? Because we saw that that's, that's where freedom is. That's where life is. How would our worship change? What would it be, how would it be different? Because I think it would be. How would our words change? What would devotion look like? How would our prayers be different? In the end, um, I'll wrap up, but in the end, none of this really is about earning God's love. We know that, right? God loves us. We talk about it all the time. What I'm talking about and what I believe this passage can teach us is all about what our love for God looks like. He loves us. What does it look like to love God? For reals. I think if anything, we are called, if we're called to anything, it's to faithfulness. That, I believe, is our tumble home. That's our worship. It's the bottom line. Hey, so I'm going to wrap up and I'm going to read one more scripture. It's been heavy, I know. We've covered a lot of ground, I know. But I believe the Holy Spirit wants to do something in the next few minutes. So if you wouldn't mind bowing your head, I'm going to read a scripture and then we'll worship for a bit. It says in Romans 8 that we are more than conquerors. And um, I'm going to read you the passage, which you will know well. But honestly, all over, wherever you're listening, wherever you're joining us, I don't know where you find yourself. And I don't know where you are internally. But maybe just maybe in this moment and moving forward from here, Maybe you need to glorify and, 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 and give honour and majesty to who our Saviour Jesus is. Maybe you have gotten familiar with what it means to be saved. And maybe you need, maybe some of us need to repent of some stuff and to choose to change in some areas. Or maybe some of you are in the toughest place you've ever been and you just need a little bit of encouragement. And I pray that the life of John the Baptist, even in his death, I pray that it will be some encouragement. Romans 8, 31. Just dwell on this as we read. What then shall we say in response to all these things? If God is for us, 
then who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or the sword? No, as it is written, for your sake we will face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, no. In all these things we are more than conquerors. Through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angel nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything in all creation will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. So Lord God, Lord, we come humbly before You. Lord, we know You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We know You are the Saviour. We know that You have died for us and, and and You rose for us. We know that You have forgiven us and that You've set us free. And so God, even now, I I ask that You would, by Your Holy Spirit, help us to live in that freedom, to know that freedom, to step up into all You have called us to, to not give up, to not let go, to not look back, but to walk forward into all You have for us. In Your mighty Name, Amen.